Hi, everyone. Welcome to Poet to Poet. I'm Rada Markham, and today I have the pleasure of talking to poet Nadia Colburn, who's the author of The High Shelf and the founder of Align Your Story. Before I introduce you to Nadia, I'd like to invite you to become a subscriber to Poet to Poet um, on Substack. If you aren't already, just go to poettopoet.substack.com and subscribe for free. In it, you'll find interviews like this one, plus helpful ideas on writing and publishing books of poetry. So today, as I said, I'm thrilled to introduce you all to Nadia Colburn. Um, Nadia is the author of The High Shelf, which came out in 2019. Her poetry and essays have appeared widely in such places as The New Yorker, American Poetry Re Review, The Kenyan Review, Conjunctions, Spirituality and Health, and more than 70 other places. Uh, she holds a PhD in English from Columbia, a BA from Harvard, is a student of the late Thich Nhat Hanh, a certified yoga teacher and activist for social and environmental justice. Uh, Nadia is also the founder of Align Your Story, writing school and coaching for women, and offers online classes, in-person classes, workshops, and retreats throughout New England. Uh, she lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her husband and two teenage children. So Nadia, welcome to Poet to Poet. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you, Ada. So today we're gonna to be talking about self-care and the writing process, particularly self-care when writing about traumatic issues or events. Um, but first I wanted to ask you about your collection, The High Shelf. Um, so as we all know, writing a book is a huge labor of love. Um, I'm just curious, how many years did it take you to develop um, the material and the poems that are in um, that book start to finish. And what was that process like for you? Well, it took me, uh, this might be the longest you've heard. It took me 20 years. I know because I wrote um, some of those, I think maybe it took me, maybe it took me 17. I don't, can't quite remember if I wrote any, no, I think one of the poems I wrote when I was pregnant with my son, um, and then another, many of them I wrote when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, and I had a manuscript of the book, um, maybe, I, I wrote the majority of the poems in a kind of cluster of a few years when maybe my daughter who's younger um, was two, two-ish. Um, and it took me a while to kind of put them together and I had a manuscript. And uh, at the time I was being published widely and I thought I'll be able to publish this relatively quickly. Um, and I was a finalist again and again and again. I think I was a finalist, I think 20 times. Um, and I got frustrated and I put the manuscript aside and I felt like there was something in the manuscript that hadn't quite come together. But I also felt very committed to the manuscript and I had other poems that had also gotten published and you know people really liked and they were saying, well, put these poems together. And I was like, I have this feeling that I want this manuscript to be, stay together as a manuscript, not to break it up. Um, and I always had the idea it was going to be called the high shelf. And so I just put it aside. And then in, I think, 2018, I took it out again and submitted it again. And then it got picked up. And then once it had got, I think I maybe revised it a little bit before sending it out again. And then once it got accepted, then I did some more revising and really finished it. Mm -hmm. That was a long journey. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as, as it is for um, so many poets that, that I know and who I've talked to about this process, it, um, it really is about persistence and, you know, allowing the material to come together in its own time. Um, but, but 20 years, you know, I mean, for me, for my book, it was over 10 years. Um, so I, I certainly relate to that, um, that feeling of, of um, you know having to having to stay with it and having to, to stick in it even though you know maybe it's just it's really close and it keeps being really close but um, yeah so it's it's a gorgeous collection um, so so you submitted it sounds like you submitted to a lot of contests 
um, or um, open reading periods where they said, yes, this is, is very close. We, we like what we're seeing here. Um, did that help give you a little bit of, of energy to keep in the process? Um, how did you feel about those, those times that you were a finalist? In the beginning, I felt encouraged and by the end, I just felt very frustrated. Um, you know, and life has a certain poetic shape to it. And then because we're poets, we make shape of things. But I think that um, I mostly send it to contests and I had a little bit of a hard time, I think fully putting it out in front of people and saying, I'm really committed to this book, please you know, publish it. I kind of wanted it to do its own work. And um, I think partly that's because the material that I was dealing with or am dealing with in the book is um, sensitive material. And so I was very close to it and it felt private. And I also at the time didn't fully understand what I was writing out of. So it was like this magical myth-making private intense world that I had created in this book, but then being super public about it and didn't just, I didn't have the muscles to do that, especially with this material. And um, when I finally years later took it out and sent it out again, I had done a lot of healing and was able to, um, and I was talking explicitly about kind of my job and my past and also my healing journey is if you will and so it felt like um I could stand behind it in a different way with more detachment it had a life of its own that wasn't as much um alive at the moment inside of me and unresolved mm -hmm. so I think that there is that kind of arc to the story as well yeah 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 the transformation that happens through the process of of writing the book and yeah that that journey that personal journey that that's mm -hmm. parallel. Um, mm -hmm. yeah I really feel that and re I think readers probably feel that in the work in the book um would you like to read a poem from the high shelf so um I'm actually going to read a poem towards the end uh and it's a little bit of a resolution poem. <laughs> the poem, the book um, has a bunch of poems in the middle with boxes. And I really think of them as kind of like the traumatic poems where I'm trying to describe what I can't describe. And, um, and I was imagining a series of Cornell, Joseph Cornell boxes where things are contained and layered and kind of collages. Um, and then this is towards the end. Oh, and I'll also say the, the title, The High Shelf, is like I was imagining this shelf that was just kind of unsupported, uh, a kind of unsupported shelf and on which we store things, which we go to things. It has a variety of metaphors in the book, which I referred to. Now, not the box, not the high shelf, but the breath, leaving coming back. I lived in the suspension caught by what I did not know. Now summer comes again, again the heat of the sun, again the children's voices rising from the sprinklers in the park. Everything I wanted to say is taken up in their voices and dissipates. A squirrel comes down the fence and rummages in the basil, eats one leaf, then another, and runs back up the tree where it has its nest high in the branches, neither caught nor unsupported. And tomorrow, tomorrow that the squirrel knows how to gather for, gathering not too much nor too little, tomorrow that the squirrel does not even try to name. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's so beautiful, such a, you know, such a sort of wonderful example of the poems in the book that that take, you know, 
take our ordinary moments and transform them into something that is um, is transformative and really speaks to this sort of um, you know the, the interior that becomes a part of, of the exterior um, world. Um, it's lovely. Thank you. So, um, so, and I encourage everyone who's uh, watching, listening, reading to pick up um, The High Shelf. It's, it's a beautiful book. Um, folks can get it on Amazon, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. And you can get it on my website as well. Or on, on Nadia's website. Mm -hmm. So. Shop or, you know, any place that sells books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. So. I understand um, through our conversations, you're really deep into the process of your next manuscript, um, which um, also approaches some issues that are, are sensitive and very personal. Um, how has working in that kind of material um, changed your process and how you approach um, the writing of this manuscript? Um. So I think that I've always actually, to some extent, been writing from personal um, di difficult mix material, whether I've kind of known it explicitly or not. And I think that one of the reasons that the high shelf, perhaps one of the reasons that the high shelf took so long to come out um, was because I wasn't, the, the writing had a knowledge that I, my conscious mind didn't have a knowledge of yet. And so we kind of had to catch up to each other. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of the joys of writing. Um, one of the powers of writing that we can access parts of ourselves through our writing that we can't access other ways. And um, when I teach writing now, I bring together meditation and writing and, and yoga often or some form of embodied practice um, because our stories are in us in so many different ways. So if we try to just get at them straight, uh, that might not be the most, um, the most direct way to get at them. Um, so if we have more strategies to tell a fuller, wholer story, and for me, poetry is one of those ways. Um, so in this new manuscript, I'm definitely writing about trauma, but the new poems actually are, um, I'm, my project has been to try to be more open because in the high shelf, I have these series of boxes where it's very contained. Um, and I was thinking I'd have a Joseph Cornell cover, but then I decided I actually wanted to get out of those boxes. And so I chose a cover of the sky instead. Um, but this next manuscript, um, I'm really trying to have more open space and trying to imagine placing difficult experiences, which often make us feel very like trapped, cut off into a larger container, which I feel like the practices of meditation and yoga often um, help also create that larger container for um, difficult experiences. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answered your question. That was maybe a roundabout way. <laughs> no, no, I, I think that's amazing um, the way that you're talking about it in terms of, um, I mean, first I wanted to go back to what you said about embodiment, right? And embodiment being something that is really important to the process of, of writing poetry um, and maybe in particular in writing poetry about trauma or, um, you know, sort of the issues that are you know, as you said, they're, they're in us, they, they're, you know, quite literally in the body, um, not just in sort of the psyche. Um, so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, about accessing poems through that sense of embodiment and how that might be different, a slightly different approach than a more intellectual one. Um, I think a lot of it is actually about getting out of our own way. <laughs> and um, I used to think of myself more as um, being in control when I was writing a poem. And now it's a dance between um, letting go and seeing what happens and then shaping it. And it's like a little bit more like, I'm not a surfer, but what people say about surfing and letting it come through me 
and um, and more process of listening than a process of um, dictating. So where does this want to go? What image do I want to use? Um, and my poems actually often come to me relatively quickly. I, it's like I have to create the conditions and then they'll kind of come through. And you know, that sounds overblown, but um, but I, I many of the poems in this new manuscript, I kind of hadn't even realized that I was writing poems. And then I kind of went back and was like, oh, I, I have all these poems here. And then I kind of went through them and got rid of many and, and kept some and kind of put them in shape. But I was like, oh, they were, they were um, teaching me about ways of being that were coming through as poems, um, even without my knowing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so when you say that you create the conditions, what does that look like? You know, is that, is that something that um, you know, it's, it's an internal creating of conditions internally, or are there actually external practices that you're, um, that you're involved in or, you know, rituals, that kind of thing. Um, say more about the, yeah. well, I, um, I kind of offer and curate for people now these external conditions, which include like I have a whole series of meditations and writing prompts that uh, people with all levels of different experience uh, have really benefited from. You know, I have friends who are working on their third poetry book and it's like, oh my gosh, I had such a breakthrough using these practices. Um, and some people have really regular daily practices. Um, I don't have a really regular daily practice. I write, like, when I feel like I have a store of things that kind of get build up in me that I need to then express, and then I'm just waiting. <laughs> and then when they're ready, then it's like, okay, I think I'm ready. I think I have something that I haven't expressed before that I want to express. And then it's about, at those times, um, I will often write after reading or after walking, definitely after meditating. Um, and sometimes after a yoga practice, but as I'm writing, I'm always kind of tuned into my body so that I, if it's not a temporal um, connection, it's a remembered connection between these different practices. And then I'll, and then I'll write. Um, but sometimes I feel like, you know, people have this idea, like I need to practice so that whenever I want to write, I can write. And mm -hmm. I'm, really believe in kind of the seasons of our creative life and um, also trusting in those that sometimes I'm going to write a lot and sometimes I'm not going to write so much and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it really strikes me how much um, resonance there, there is between those types of practices, you know, the yoga, meditation, um, even, you know, just going outside and taking a walk, um, those in seem to me to align perfectly with what you said earlier about this new manuscript, really wanting you wanting to have, um, you know, openness as part of, um, you know, what, what generates and what is generated by that process of, of writing, um, because each of those things, you know, yoga is openness in the body, right? Trying to allow for more space, um, going outside, literally, we're getting that, that open space. And, and in meditation, you know, when, when meditation works well, it can create that, that sort of mental um, openness. So, um, so there's a real sense of, of synergy between those those practices and, and the writing process, it seems like. Yeah. And I think it's changing, um, but I when I was 
studying poetry more uh, when I was younger, kind of more in like poetry workshops. I felt like there was a a lot of like angst in poems. Like that American poetry was full of a lot of like very tight spaces. Mm -hmm. And this kind of, I mean, it's great to have tension in a line, but there's also a lot of really great poetry. Um, like Wilka, he's not really working so much on like tons of tension. I think Whitman, right? Like there's there's a lot of poetry that's like more going for openness. And I, I um, didn't feel like I was getting, a, seeing a lot of that in the contemporary poetry world when I was studying, we kind of like in the circles I was in. And, and I felt also like there's a kind of political, spiritual desire for this openness as well, because we live in this society that's so anxious and it's so tense and it's so kind of uncomfortable in so many ways. And I li lived in that state for a really long time, like uncomfortable, it's kind of unhealthily in my own body. And so I was like, you know, there's, and then a kind of attachment to that. Like you're not really awake to what's going on if you're not participating in this tension mm -hmm. and just a different way of being where you could say, you know, I actually believe that we can come into greater peace and greater harmony and greater um, poetic vision <laughs> if, we, if we look for a different way. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been my project. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I just couldn't agree more about that, that insight about the tension and the tension on lines and, um, you know, what a, what a wonderful um, sort of invitation to poets to think about, okay, well, do I want to embrace that, that kind of contemporary tension or, you know, maybe there's this other choice that I have um, to make, um, you know, no matter what the material is. Um, but particularly, it seems important to be asking that question around the material that's so, you know, so deeply personal, um, you know, whether that's, you know, a personal trauma or reflecting on our ecological situation, or really any of those things that, that touch us um, that can, you know, I mean, even saying, you know, ecological, uh, you know, talking about that, like I can already feel myself in my body, have this little, it's like a zing of energy that, that could get closed down around um, and, you know, turned into something that's, that's tighter. Um, maybe yeah. that's one response, but what happens when, when there is that space to be more open around those, those bits of, um, you know, potentially difficult um, things that are coming up. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you said that because I know you write about ecological issues and kind of global issues like nuclear issues, but then also related to family and um, that sometimes we can think, oh, well, you know, meditation, yoga, that's kind of like self-help, that's just personal, but hey, look at the world, look at the state of the world. We can't have that kind of soft attitude when we get to like looking at really hard issues like nuclear, or, you know, the climate crisis, all of these things. And, and I really think that that's a misunderstanding um, of what we need to make large structural changes as well. Mm -hmm. And because um, well, one of my main spiritual teachers is Thich Nhat Hanh, who you mentioned, who is a um, Buddhist Vietnamese monk. And for those of you who don't know, was very, very active uh, peace activist in the war and really um, also incredible, just incredibly articulate around the climate crisis and the ecological crisis. And um, teaches us that we can find peace and change and structural change at the same time, that what we are hoping for, what we are working towards is peace and that we can act in peace. And, you know, 
um, Thich Nhat Hanh worked with and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and was inspired by Gandhi. This is not a new idea, right? It's just an another tradition of working on larger structural um, global issues, just from a, a different perspective where we can we can have the inner piece and the outer piece more aligned mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you know <laughs> I'm well, but I think this is not yeah. a conversation you hear very often in um you know in workshops or in um you know the certainly in the the halls of academia these days um so it, you know it is somewhat of a radical perspective to take on the work that we're trying to do in in our poems and in in the world at the same time yeah it's very powerful so so any advice to poets in terms of you know self-care and working in these these issues and personal traumas yeah um well i would say personal and you know, social, global traumas, whatever they are, they're activating us in our bodies. And, um, and they're important. And it's important that we're doing this work. And um, I do believe that in um, that change doesn't happen without a change in our mentality and a change in the stories that we're telling. So this work that we're doing to give voice to traumatic materials and to shift the story is very powerful work. It's powerful individual work and it's also powerful political work. Even if we're writing poems and not that many people read them, it's like wherever it happens, it's a little bit of grass growing up through the concrete. Mm -hmm. So just to believe in the work that you're doing and to trust in the process and not to force it, um, to be gentle and to know really that that gentleness also can be part of the process that we want to be the change that we are um that we are that we're hoping for basically and that part of that for me at least is kind of love and peace and that sometimes the hardest way to feel that love and peace is towards ourselves, and that can really be part of the practice to really be gentle um, and and as, 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 I've, as I've said, I really find that meditation, yoga, walking, being in the body, um, having that bigger container is very helpful. Um, having supportive friends who really can see what you're doing and kind of be with you through the process, who are other poets, so, so helpful. Having a community of other poets, um, so, so helpful. Um, sometimes having a coach some, or a teacher um, I sometimes find that, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with someone can be more helpful than being in a class where there isn't really space. So mm -hmm. all of those are self-care um, techniques and, and trusting, again, just trusting the process. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes over decades. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Fun. So um, where can people find you if they want to stay in touch or find out more about your, your work, your classes, your books? Yes. So um, I have a website, which is just my name. So www.nadiacolburn.com. And I do have a lot of free resources for writers. So I have meditations that you can download for writers. I have some yoga that you can download. I also have some publication guides if you want to, you know, have a little manual how to get published a poetry book published I have a lot of free resources for writers um, and I have classes as well including a class on the poetry of attention um, and my book is there you can also find my book on Amazon as we said so yeah and I'm also very uh, accessible so if you send me a comment through my contact form I would love to hear from anyone Great. yeah well Nadia it's been an absolute pleasure to get this chance to talk to you. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if you were interested in, um, in this conversation, like this interview, please consider sharing it. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter at poet2poet.substack.com. And until next time, be well and keep writing.